हेलो एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग आई एम डॉक्टर वैष्णवी आई होप यू आर एबल टू सी मी एंड लिसन टू मी इफ यू आर देन काइंडली गिव मी अ क्विक थम्स अप इफ यू आर एबल टू सी मी एंड लिसन टू मी so before we start our class uh, let me just inform you about what we have on offering from an academy so uh, we have this neat pg 2023 batch course which which has a free 6 months extension on subscription of one year it's a limited period offer you can use the code ent life to get a 10% off and uh, to be able to take the subscription the price rise uh is going to come soon so act as fast as possible to take the subscriptions again you can use the code npg10 or you can use the code ent life and you will get the 10% off on plus subscription we offer you uh you know live classes as well as recorded classes from one of the top educators of the country with tests and quizzes we have iconic subscription which offers an academy subscription as well as prep ladder subscription in this special class features we have something called as raise the hand where you can talk live to your educators during the classes and get your doubts cleared instantly in real time if you just in case miss a class you can refer back to the uh, the previous class which is recorded the lecture notes are available you can do it any time anywhere neat pg an academy light is a option for those who are looking only for practice test you don't want theory content you don't want any explanatory content but you want only a platform that is going to give you practice test so for the practice session we have got this an academy light for neat pg so we have subject wise tests here system wise tests here full length mock papers here pyqs here and test series which have been curated by top educators so we have separately for neat pg i n i set fmg separate test for each of these categories so all those who are targeting each of these examination can only take the test series if you are not interested into the complete uh, subscription now we have this as the free test calendar for our FT fmge practice league so those who are appearing for the examinations i would request to take these uh, tests so the upcoming test that we have uh, is on 26th may by dr ankit we have dr saurabh doing surgery on 27th puneet sir doing obstetrics and gynec and we have dr vinish and dr mukul who are going to do anesthesia and orthopedics dr zainab bora and sandeep govil doing psychiatry and radiology and we have dr sanjay khatri doing the pediatrics test we have exclusively upsc cms revision course for those who are targeting the upsc batch so it's only one and a half month course with 190 hours so you will get revision and previous years questions of the last two years so the topics of the subjects covered are obg pediatrics surgery medicine and psm we have target next 23 batch which is a subject wise test subject wise batch so grand tests and subject tests will be conducted interactive live classes recorded classes will be conducted we have pyq bank exclusively on an academy that will give you all the pyqs at one place yes yes we are starting just a second uh, i just have to inform this to those students who do not know so that is why i'm taking a little bit of time here and i will start the questions in just a minute so daily practice papers on an academy allow you to practice the questions on a day to day basis we have prof and neat pg subscription as well so ideal treatment for this so there is a clinical image showing you some condition can you tell me what is the ideal treatment for this rifampicin excision with cauterization of base tetracycline or laser you can answer in the chat box what you think is the right answer okay so nishtha says b and uh, shit post also says b everyone's on b exactly so you see here a reddish vascular mass which is suggestive to you of rhinosporidiosis so this is your rhinosporidiosis and this is your histopathology picture showing sporangia with spores so if you get sporangia with spores and a red vascular mass in the nasal cavity it is rhinosporidiosis the treatment is excision of the mass with cauterization of the base the drug that is given to prevent recurrence is dapsone 
so dapsone is given to prevent recurrence otherwise we just ex excise the mass and cauterize the base now rifampicin tetracycline are used for rhinoscleroma they are not used for rhinosporidiosis they are used for rhinoscleroma the most common cause of nasal bleeding is trauma to littles area arteriovenous aneurysm hypertension angiofibroma i am waiting for your answers okay so i see most of you some of you are on a some of you are on d okay so the most common cause of nose bleeding they haven't mentioned to you the age they haven't mentioned you anything at all so the most common cause is often trauma so trauma to little area because of nasal picking finger picking is often the cause in adults if they specifically mention most common cause of nasal bleeding in adults then your answer will be hypertension if they mention the most common cause of nasal bleeding in a juvenile male then your answer will be angiofibroma so when they haven't mentioned to you these specific terminologies of adults or juvenile male then you are going to go for trauma which is often to the littles area okay the nerve damage in zygomatic fracture is supra orbital nerve infra orbital nerve facial nerve lingual nerve okay i'm seeing answer coming as c by most of you medico says b ridima agni says c what about others okay so whenever there is a zygomatic fracture the fracture occurs at the zygomatico maxillary junction zygomatico frontal junction zygomatico temporal junction so since we have three points of fracture zygomatic fracture is also called as tripod fracture now whenever there is a tripod fracture there is a possibility of the inferior orbital wall to get injured so when there is an infra orbital nerve injury that is what we see in zygomatic fracture so infra orbital nerve is the nerve that you see involved in the floor of the orbit in zygomatic fracture so the answer is infra orbital nerve so you can see here this bone is called as the zygoma okay so this bone is your zygoma this fracture at the zygomatico frontal zygomatico maxillary and zygomatico temporal so which wall is in close relation here we have the floor of the orbit now the nerve that exits from the floor of the orbit is your infra orbital nerve so the nerve that can get involved is your infra orbital nerve juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is supplied by internal maxillary artery ascending pharyngeal artery facial artery lingual artery okay debraj on the plus platform i don't know there was some technical glitch we got a message from the server itself that uh, there is some technical glitch because of which i although i was there available i couldn't take the class okay so juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma so as the name suggests it's a vascular tumor it has a supply from a very important artery the artery that is the main feeder to this tumor is the internal maxillary artery now if i ask a question what is the most common site of origin of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma what will your answer be because jna is a common topic that they ask so i'm just revising to you so what is the most common site of origin of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma please answer in the chat box 
no smoke smolens education it's not the lateral wall the most common site of origin is pheno palatine foramen no shed post fossa of rosenmuller is for nasopharyngeal carcinoma we are talking of a benign tumor angiofibroma so the most common site of origin is pheno palatine foramen now if i ask you is this disease seen exclusively in males or exclusively in females what will your answer be yes it is a disease that is exclusively seen in males why is it seen exclusively in males it is dependent on what for its growth what does it depend on for its growth it depends on testosterone for its growth so this is a tumor that depends on testosterone for its growth okay now what is the investigation of choice for diagnosing angiofibroma the investigation of choice is it a ct is it an mri is it a plain ct or is it a contrast ct i hope the lag has got settled now yes it is investigation of choice for diagnosing is contrast enhanced ct scan then do you do angiography yes we do angiography why do you do angiography to identify the feeding vessel which is supplying the tumor and the most common feeding vessel is internal maxillary artery and what is the treatment of angiofibroma it is embolization followed by surgical excision so the treatment of angiofibroma is embolization followed by surgical excision so i hope you had quick one liners revision here with uh, angiofibroma okay now let's see the next question ramu a 15 year old male presents with hemorrhage 5 hours after tonsillectomy the best treatment for this patient is external gauze packing antibiotics and mouthwash irrigation with cold saline re-explore immediately yes i am waiting for your answer ramu 15 year old male presents to you with hemorrhage 5 hours after tonsillectomy what is the best treatment for this patient yes so whenever there is a bleeding that occurs 5 hours after tonsillectomy it comes under reactionary hemorrhage so we classify hemorrhage or bleeding after tonsillectomy as primary which happens in the ot or during the surgery reactionary whenever it occurs within 24 hours after surgery and secondary anything after 24 hours but less than 14 days that is called as secondary now reactionary hemorrhage commonly occurs because of slippage of ligature meaning there was some bleeder an artery or a vein and you have ligated it but now that there is a slippage of ligature post operatively the patient is started to bleeding so if there is a reactionary hemorrhage due to slippage of ligature what should you do you must take the patient immediately to ot and re explore you must close you You must again ligate the bleeding point. Secondary hemorrhage commonly occurs because of infection. So this can be managed with antibiotics and local management. If it still persists, then we can go for surgery. So reactionary hemorrhage management is immediately re-explore, whereas secondary hemorrhage you can give antibiotics, watch, and then re-explore based upon the situation. So I hope you all understood the management of hemorrhage after tonsillectomy. all the following are true about retropharyngeal abscess except confined to one side of the midline can be palpable per orally by pressing the finger on the posterior pharyngeal wall it lies behind the prevertebral fascia presents with dysphagia and difficulty in breathing 
I'll just get a glass of water for myself. Meanwhile, you can answer in the chat box and I'll see what have you answered. Okay, so I see majority of you have answered C. So that's the right answer. So it does not lie behind the prevertebral fascia. It lies in front of prevertebral fascia. So the, the space that lies behind the prevertebral fascia is called as which space? Anybody can tell me? So this is your vertebra. Covering which we have the prevertebral fascia. This is your buccopharyngeal fascia. So, this space which is present between your buccopharyngeal fascia and your prevertebral fascia is your retropharyngeal space. Then, what is this space which is behind the prevertebral fascia? This space is called as prevertebral space. Okay. Clear to everyone the difference between retropharyngeal space and prevertebral space? Retropharyngeal space is in front of the prevertebral fascia, whereas prevertebral space is behind the prevertebral fascia. Okay, so this is space, not as retropharyngeal space is not a midline space, but it is present on one side of the midline. It can be palpated per orally by pressing the finger against the posterior pharyngeal wall. It can present to you with dysphagia and difficulty in breathing, but it does not lie behind the prevertebral fascia. It lies in front of the prevertebral fascia. So this space that you see here, this is your retropharyngeal space, which lies in front of prevertebral fascia, whereas this space that you see behind the prevertebral fascia is called as the prevertebral space okay so nerve supply sensory of the larynx below the level of vocal cord is from which nerve external branch of superior laryngeal nerve internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve recurrent laryngeal nerve inferior laryngeal nerve Okay, so I see answers coming in for C. Let me see what others are answering for. Medico, Mandar, Vridhima, you all are, are at C. Very good. So the sensory nerve supply of the larynx below the level of vocal cord is via recurrent laryngeal nerve. But the sensory nerve supply of the larynx above the level of vocal cord is via superior laryngeal nerve. Now, superior laryngeal nerve has two branches, the internal laryngeal nerve and the external laryngeal nerve. So, the sensory nerve supply above the level of vocal cord is from the internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve. The external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve supplies a muscle. Can anybody tell me in the chat box which muscle does the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve supply? I am waiting for your answers. Which nerve supplies the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve? Very good medico, cricothyroid. All the muscles, the motor function of the larynx, all the muscles are supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerve. Except the cricothyroid muscle, this cricothyroid muscle is supplied via the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve. So that is the answer. It is supplied by the external branch of superior laryngeal nerve. Okay, let's go to the next question. Trismus is seen in all except Ludwig's angina, Quincy, prevertebral abscess, parapharyngeal abscess. 
so i'm waiting for your answers christmas is seen in all except what is christmas difficulty in opening the mouth is called as christmas yes so if there is a difficulty in opening the mouth why does this occur this occur commonly whenever the pterygoid muscles are involved because of infection or inflammation either the medial pterygoid the lateral pterygoid is involved which is attached to the mandible if there is a spasm of these muscles opening the mouth becomes difficult so when there is a cellulitis of the submandibular space obviously can you not expect trismus to occur so what is ludwig's angina cellulitis of the submandibular space so can it result in trismus yes it can result in trismus so this is true quincy is very tonsillar abscess when there is a tonsillitis a tonsillar infection can it go easily to the pterygoids can the inflammation yes so this is also true but pre vertebral abscess is somewhere posteriorly do you think it will come to the mandible and the pterygoids no this is false and parapharyngeal space is just here the lateral boundary of the parapharyngeal space is mandible with the pterygoids so can it cause trismus true so this the answer is trismus can be caused by all except pre vertebral abscess the learning point is have you understood which are the causes of trismus through this question it can be ludwig's angina it can be quincy it can be parapharyngeal abscess okay so i hope you all got the answer to this question now look at this image this image has come quite a few times in the recent fmg examinations which is why this image is here for discussion so can you tell me what is this image representing what is your diagnosis based upon this image and what is the name given to this sign that you see in the image no shit post this is not blowout fracture blowout fracture is if there is injury to the floor of the orbit here the floor of orbit is absolutely fine in floor of the orbit fracture the fat prolapses into maxillary sinus where you get tear drop sign that is blowout fracture but here we are not seeing something like that very good nishtha do you see there is anterior bowing of posterior wall of maxillary sinus this is your anterior wall of maxillary sinus and is this your posterior wall of maxillary sinus so if there is an anterior bowing of the posterior wall of maxillary sinus what will you this call this sign this sign is called as holman miller sign it is also called as antral sign so holman miller sign is anterior bowing of posterior wall of maxillary sinus it is also called as antral sign this is a sign that you see in patients with juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma so if you see this sign you must think about juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma i have discussed some more mcqs or one liners of angiofibroma with the previous questions i hope you understand this sign which is anterior bowing of <coughs> posterior wall of maxillary sinus which is called as holman miller sign okay okay fine now identify and grade what are you seeing in this image what is it telling you so identify and grade it so what is this x ray showing you this is a soft tissue x ray taken in a lateral view it is showing you something so what is it that you are seeing in this x ray soft tissue lateral view of the face i'll give you a clue do you see some soft tissue here the outline of which i am marking which is present at the junction of roof and posterior wall of the nasopharynx so what is this tissue which is present at the junction of roof and the posterior wall of nasopharynx no shit post it's not angiofibroma 
see you see there is a tissue at the roof of the nasopharynx and the posterior wall of nasopharynx very good medico this is an adenoid this is a basic x-ray of an adenoid hypertrophy so if you see the space between the palate and the base of skull and you divide this space each occupying 25 percent of the airway space you can see the soft tissue is occupying more than three quadrants so this is going to be a grade four adenoid so if it is occupying more than 75 percent of the airway space then you call it as grade 4 adenoid if it is present between 0 to 25 percent of the airway space then you will grade it as grade 1 26 to 50 percent of the airway space then you will call it as grade 2 51 to 75 percent you will grade it as grade 3 and more than 75 percent you will grade it as grade 4 adenoid okay Surgical emphysema after tracheostomy is corrected by taking more stitches of the wound, cold compress, widening of the wound by removal of stitches, temporary closure of the tracheostomy tube. What will you do? Krishna Pabha says C, Agni says C, Ridhima says C. Very good. So whenever we do a tracheostomy, now imagine this is your skin subcutaneous tissue, this is your trachea. Now whenever you have made an opening in the trachea, the air can escape and go into the subcutaneous planes to cause surgical emphysema. So what should you do? You should remove these stitches so that the air can escape out. You should never tie the stitches tight around the tracheostomy wound so that it will cause emphysema. So if there is an emphysema, you must widen this wound by removal of some stitches. So this should be your answer. Now, if the same question is apnea after tracheostomy is corrected by now instead of surgical emphysema, if they would have given the same question with apnea, what would your answer be? A, B, C or D? I am waiting to see who is going to answer this if they ask you the same question with apnea. very good then the answer would have been d temporary closure because whenever there is a opening that you make in the trachea the carbon dioxide washout can occur when there is carbon dioxide washout there is no stimulus for the respiratory centers so as a result it can result in apnea so when you temporarily close the tracheostomy tube what will happen carbon dioxide levels will build up and this hypercarbon uh, increase in the carbon dioxide levels will cause stimulation of the respiratory centers and release the apnea so if there is apnea after tracheostomy it is corrected by temporary closure of the tracheostomy tube otoscopic manifestation of chronic secretory otitis media may include all of the following it is not chronic secretory it is chronic sapurative includes all the following except perforation of the pars placida, transverse handle of malleus, absent cone of light, air bubbles behind the tympanic membranes. So all of them are manifestations except one thing. Ridhima says B. What about others? So if I ask you what are the two types of CSOM, will you tell me either it is a tubotympanic type or an aticoantral type? Yes. Now in tubotympanic type, do we have a disease of the pars tensa? 
where we may have either a perforation where we may have a retraction so can we see absent cone of light because of perforation yes can we see transverse handle of malleus because of retraction yes in atico anteral variety can we see a perforation in pars placida yes but air bubbles behind the tympanic membrane is suggestive of non saturative otitis media also called as secretory otitis media also called as gluer so if you see air bubbles behind the tympanic membrane it is suggestive of nsom otitis media with effusion or gluer all of them would mean the same so except air bubbles so all the three can be manifestations of csom except air bubbles behind the tympanic membrane okay after laparoscopic appendectomy patient had a fall from her bed on her nose after which she had a swelling in the nose and difficulty in breathing so you see there is a swelling on either side of the septum and there is a difficulty in breathing as well next step in the management is iv antibiotics for 7 to 10 days observation in the hospital surgical drainage discharge after 2 days and follow the patient up after 8 weeks so i'm waiting for your answers to come in so if a patient had a fall from the bed and after trauma if there is a swelling on either side of the septum will we think of the diagnosis of a septal hematoma yes a septal abscess also can present with a similar clinical finding but they will have fever they will have headache they will have lymphadenopathy but we don't see any of those three features in here so our diagnosis is typically a septal hematoma so for a septal hematoma will you do a surgical drainage yes you will do a surgical drainage for a septal hematoma if it is a small you will just aspirate the hematoma if it is a large hematoma you will incise and drain the hematoma but what is important is to do a pressure packing on either side of the septum so on the right side and left side of the nose you are going to fill either with ribbon gauze or with uh, you know uh, gel foam or whatever material and put pressure packing across the septum on both the sides so that there is no recurrence of hematoma now why should you drain and why should you not only observe because if you do not drain and if you just leave it like that a hematoma can get infected and form an abscess and an abscess can result in deformity like a saddle nose deformity or there may be retrograde spread to the cavernous sinus to cause cavernous sinus thrombosis which is why it is important to drain a hematoma so i hope all of you got the answer to this question let's go to the next one caldwell's view is done for sphenoid ethmoid maxillary frontal i'm waiting for your answers very good amit yadav what about others what when do you do a caldwell's view yes caldwell's view is occipito frontal view this occipito frontal view is done for frontal sinus now if you see here this is pra's view so if you have got occipital mental view but with mouth open so you can see the mouth is open and you are able to see the sphenoid sinus so occipital mental view with mouth open is pra's view but if you get only occipital mental view only without mouth open then we call it as waters view waters view is the best view for the maxillary sinus pra's view is for the sphenoid sinus and this is your occipital frontal view and this occipital frontal view is used for frontal sinus so this is for your frontal sinuses okay 
a young female with a long history of sinusitis presents with frequent episodes of fever headache of recent onset along with personality changes fundus examination revealed papilloedema most likely diagnosis is frontal lobe abscess meningitis orbital cellulitis encephalitis okay so some of you are saying b some of you are on a so if there is a fever a headache you can think about meningitis but typically personality changes whenever there is a behavioral change as a personality change the frontal lobe is involved in the personality of the behave or behavioral pattern of a particular individual so if i have an abscess sitting in that area will the function of that lobe be compromised yes and if the function of that lobe is compromised it can result in such changes so if you are having fever headache personality changes papilloedema you must think about a frontal lobe abscess the current treatment of choice for a large anthraquinal polyp in a 10 year old is intranasal polypectomy caldwell lock operation fes lateral rhinotomy and excision so whenever there is an anthraquinal polyp you must understand that it is occurring secondary to infection that this polyp has occurred even if you give antibiotics you may clear the infection but the polyps will not decrease or uh, disappear with antibiotics so if there is a large anthraquinal polyp you have to do a surgery and the surgery of choice is functional endoscopic sinus surgery which is fes so the treatment of choice is functional endoscopic sinus surgery okay so this is your answer which is fes the most common cause of nose bleeding is trauma to little area av aneurysm hypertension angiofibroma we have already discussed this it's a very simple question very good it is trauma to the littles area destruction of the right labyrinth would cause nystagmus towards the right side towards the left side pendular nystagmus no nystagmus so i'm waiting for your answers nitesh says a krishna prabha says b amit says b what about others so this right labyrinth is trying to pull the eye towards the right side the left labyrinth is trying to pull towards the left side now when equal pull is exerted by both the sides where will the eye be will it be in the midline position yes if both are having normal power or equal power eye will be in midline position now if there is a hyperactive labyrinth on one side normal labyrinth on another side where will you see the nystagmus who to the labyrinth which has more power so if there is a hyperactive labyrinth it will go towards the diseased side then nystagmus will be seen towards the diseased side now if there is a hypoactive or a destructed labyrinth on one side normal labyrinth on another side so there is a hypo on one side normal on another side where will the nystagmus be towards the hypo or towards the normal who has more power now the opposite side so where will the nystagmus go towards the opposite side <coughs> so they are telling you the right side is destroyed it is hypo 
where will the nystagmus go towards the hypo side or towards the normal side normal obviously because it has more power so it will go towards the left side very good which of the following nerve supplies the pinna marked as x so what is this area supplied by is it supplied by arnold's nerve auriculo temporal nerve lesser occipital nerve greater occipital nerve So redema hyperactive labyrinth you can see in labyrinthitis specifically in diffuse the serous type of labyrinthitis or circumscribed labyrinthitis it is also seen in Meniere's disease. Hypoactive is either because of destruction of the labyrinth post labyrinthectomy or either it can be because of use of ototoxic medications or either it can be because of any diffuse saturative form of labyrinthitis. So this is how you identify C, uh, hyperactive from hypoactive labyrinth or the clinical conditions which are hyper and hypo. Okay. So here this X is supplied via the auriculotemporal nerve. The lower half is supplied via the greater auricular nerve. Anterior part upper surface is supplied via the auriculotemporal nerve. The posterior part is supplied via the lesser occipital nerve. The area of the concha is supplied via the Arnold's nerve which is the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. Along with that there is seventh nerve which supplies. So the area that has been marked as X is supplied via the auriculotemporal nerve. In the image given below it shows the stepedial reflex. What does X denote? Superior olivary complex, medial geniculate body, superior colliculus, lateral meniscus. I'm waiting for your answers. I can see Nishtha and Sheikh Nasreen marked as A already. Balwan Singh says B. Okay. So the correct answer is superior olivary complex. So whenever we talk about stepedial reflex, whenever you give a loud sound, this sound, loud sound travels towards the cochlea of that side. Say we have given right sided loud sound, it goes to the right cochlea. From there it goes via the eighth nerve or the cochlear nerve. From there cochlear nucleus, from there superior olivary complex. Now at the level of superior olivary complex, you will see lateral decussation of fibers going to the facial nerve nucleus on the ipsilateral side, also going to the contralateral side. So once there is loud sound given to one ear, you will see bilateral contraction of the stepedius muscle and this lateral decussation is happening at the level of superior olivary complex. Which of the following is a contraindication for the procedure shown below? Otosclerosis, myringosclerosis, glomus tumor, thick tympanic membrane. What are you seeing here? The image is showing you something called as myringotomy. So whenever you do a myringotomy, what would you see or what would you expect? You are releasing the middle ear pressure or fluid that is there. Now imagine middle ear has a tumor which is very vascular and this tumor has blood vessels that lacks the tunica media so if there is a tumor that lacks the muscular layer in the blood vessels it will not be able to contract even on application of pressure on adrenaline so if you happen to poke your myringotomy knife onto the tumor it can cause profuse torrential bleeding so the answer for contraindication of this procedure or myringotomy is glomus tumor 
the following test is done for identifying the lesion of which cranial nerve third sixth seventh or eighth I'm waiting for your answers. So Nitesh says one, Nithya says three, Balwan says one. So what is this test? Are we putting filter paper in the lower fornix and looking for lacrimation? Yes. And what is this test called as? It is called as Schirmer's test. So this Schirmer's test is a test that is done to assess lacrimation. So lacrimation is occurring with the supply of a nerve called as greater superficial petrosal nerve. This greater superficial petrosal nerve is a branch of the first genu of the facial nerve. So obviously if there is a facial nerve involvement, GSPN won't be able to function on that side and lacrimation will be affected. So you can see there is a difference in the lacrimation of one side versus other side. So there is less lacrimation on one side and good lacrimation on other side. So this is suggestive that there is probably a facial nerve pathology and the TERS test is called as Schirmer's test. What is the single most important investigation in this condition? CT scan of the temporal bone, CT scan of the paranasal sinuses, IgE and RAST, flexible nasoendoscopy. <coughs> I'm waiting for your answers. What is the single most important investigation? So Nishta says one, Amit Yadav also says A. What about others? See, I'm giving you clue. What are you seeing here? Are you seeing some air pockets or air bubbles? So if you see some air pockets or air bubbles, what is it suggestive of? It is suggestive of serous otitis media, also called as secretory otitis media, also called as glue ear. Okay, so whenever there is a serous otitis media, secretory otitis media, or a glue ear, will you think about a probable eustachian tubal dysfunction? And whenever there is a eustachian tubal dysfunction, is there a nasal cause and a nasopharyngeal cause? Yes. So if there is a eustachian tubal dysfunction secondary to a nasal cause or a nasopharyngeal cause, would you want to do first of all a nasal endoscopy to identify if there is a tumor, if there is a polyp, if there is a DNS, if there is a uh, you know nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, carcinoma, adenoid, what is there in the nose and the nasopharynx? Yes. So the first investigation and the most important is flexible nasal endoscopy. A 6 year child with recurrent URTI and impaired hearing is treated initially with weight and watch, grome insertion, myringotomy plus grome, adenoidectomy plus grome. So 6 year old child with recurrent URTI impaired hearing is treated initially with. So when there is only impaired hearing, there is no pain, there is no fever, you must think about again serous otitis media or glue ear or secretory otitis media or non-separative otitis media. So this is what you will think of if there is impaired hearing. Now initially it is managed with wait and watch because it is known to resolve spontaneously. So if there is a spontaneous resolution. Now you wait and watch for how long? For 12 weeks. Now beyond 12 weeks, if it still persists, then what will you do? You will do a myringotomy, you will do a grome and you will treat the underlying cause which could be adenoid most often in 6 year old child. 
so myringotomy grooming and treat the underlying cause would be the answer if it persists beyond 12 weeks now the question is asking initially so your answer should be wait and watch okay a child less than 2 years of age with otalgia and otorrhea so young child with pain and discharge what is the most likely diagnosis otitis externa otitis media with effusion acute otitis media or congenital cholesteatoma Amit Yadav, recurrent URTI is there but have they given you features of adenoid facies like high arched palate, pinched nose, failure to thrive uh, or any other features of adenoid facies they haven't. So when they haven't given you any features of adenoid hypertrophy, they have just told because of URTI the child is having impaired hearing. So the first diagnosis that is serous otitis media. They have asked you specifically initially treated with then your answer is wait and watch. Got it Amit? So here child less than 2 years of age with otalgia and otorrhea is most likely to have acute otitis media. So acute otitis media should be your answer for any patient who is a child because eustachian tubal disorders are commonly seen in children as eustachian tube is shorter, straighter and more horizontal. So since it is short, straight and horizontal, eustachian tubal disorders are common in young children. Now pain and infection are diseases of middle ear. So acute otitis media will be your answer. What is the role of this procedure in a patient with cholestatoma? Are they doing oral toileting? Are they visualizing the tympanic membrane? Are they assessing the hearing levels or are they performing a fistula test? So you can see this is an otoscope. To the otoscope you see there is an attachment. This is called as Siegel's pneumatic speculum. Now whenever you inflate the cuff, what will happen? The pressure in the external auditory canal will increase. Now if the pressure in the external auditory canal increases, it is transmitted to the middle ear because we have a thin tympanic membrane. Now if there is no communication between the middle ear and the inner ear, the pressure is not transmitted to the inner ear. As a result, there is no vertigo or there is no nystagmus. But if there is a condition where there is erosion, as a result, now what will happen? The pressure can go from middle ear to inner ear to cause vertigo or nystagmus. So in cholesteatoma, can we expect erosion? Yes. Can the most common semicircular canal to be eroded this lateral semicircular canal? Yes. So in a patient with cholesteatoma, are we trying to assess if there is a fistula or a communication between middle ear and inner ear by doing this test? Yes. So the answer is this is done to perform a fistula test. So with this, I finish my class. I hope these questions were useful for you. I'll try to incorporate the important ones for your examination like adenoid, like tonsil, like angiofibroma, like cholesteatoma, CSOM, ASOM, SOM. One hour is a really short time, but whatever I could, I have incorporated in this. I will try and do more of these sessions on an academy special class platform which is a free platform. So those of you who are interested can log in tomorrow day after tomorrow where I will be taking sequentially two days only for FMG students for their examination as a last leap for revision. You can use the code again ENT Live to unlock the free classes. You don't have to pay anything for these special classes. These are absolutely free. So you just have to use the code ENT Live and you can log into the class. And those interested to buy subscription may feel free to do so and get another 10% off so hope you guys have enjoyed this session and i will see you all again until next time take care and bye bye